We are uh, very excited to have uh, Dan Sanjun give the second uh, keynote talk uh, uh, of the conference. Uh, Dan, hope the NSA preview went well. Everything was good. Um, so he, he's a very well-known person in the community. If you don't know him, uh, let me briefly introduce him. Um, he's an associate vice president for research at the University of Texas, Austin, since 2018 and the executive director of the TAC uh, since 2014. And as you know, the TAC has really, really large scale systems and he's in charge of all those things. Um, and he's the PI of the National Science Foundation grant to acquire and deploy Frontera. Uh, I think many of you actually use this system. So um, he's the overall PI there. He's also the PI of the TAC Stampede 2, Wrangler systems, um, and many other systems um, at, at TAC. Uh, for six uh, years, he was also a co-PI of Cybers, a large-scale NSF's life science cyber infrastructure. He was also a co-PI for Tax Ranger and Lone Star computers. So this goes back in the history. Uh, and um, we have been working with Dan and his team since the Ranger days. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Dan received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and his master's degree and doctorate in computer engineering from uh, Clemson University. So today's talk... Um, it is very exciting. Uh, he will be talking about On the Horizon, Interconnects in Frontera and its uh, coming replacement system. Uh, so let's uh, give a big uh, hearty welcome to Dan. Well, thank you very much, DK. Uh, the trick is I haven't been on WebEx for a while, much Zoom. Um, yeah. And you can share your slides. Wanting me yeah. to restart to share. So um, do you have the okay. slides up? Or should I just restart uh, real quick? Uh, maybe, re maybe restart real quick. Okay, I'll like, be back just... in 30 seconds. Yep. Okay. So, all right. Bye. Uh, sorry for the technical issues, guys. Just uh, hold on, as Dan mentioned. All right, I'm back. Thanks. Hey, Dan. Yeah, so you can share the again. And... Yep, and it's letting me share now, so. Good. Okay. So everybody can see the slides and all that stuff? Yes, yes. Now we can see in the presentation mode. So you are good to go, Dan. All right, great. So, all right, thanks very much. And yes, as DK mentioned, we were just finishing up an NSF site visit. And in fact, the program officers for Frontera walked out of my office at uh, 128 your time. So leaving me a minute and a half to get on this uh, meeting. So, uh, sorry, WebEx upgrades now all complete. So um, I do wanna apologize for not being there in person, but yes, we had our first NSF in-person review in two and a half years. Um, yeah, the, technically it was supposed to end an hour ago, but in fact, ended a minute and a half ago. So um, I hope to get back there to Columbus to join you again soon. I was up there for this meeting in 2017, 18, and 19, at least according to my old talks. Um, and uh, I hope to be able to rejoin you again uh, next year. So yeah, we, um, we missed you uh, in the uh, trivia challenge. We missed our uh, trivia champion. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, you know, until that last question. I'm great until then. So um, and then we throw it all away. So uh, thanks, sorry, but yes, I will be part of trivia next year if we can make all that happen. So, uh, um, so I did want to, um, basically divide this talk into a couple of pieces. Um, as DK said, uh, in, in invited me and said, you, you know, talk about interconnects and stuff. And he said, you're talking at hot interconnects, surely you can use that. So I'm using some of that. That was really sort of a different focus. Um, 
And what I really want to do is sort of talk about where we are today, um, what sort of we, things we've learned about interconnects through our many, many years of working with the Mbappage team, uh, and then where I think we're going to go with our next system, um, or options for where we're going to go with our next system and how we're evaluating that, including looking at the sort of world of disaggregation, right? And where does things like CXL and extended PCI and NVLink fit into our interconnects that one day we might have to cross and make our MPI messages cross as well. Um, and how we see all that fitting in, in terms of the system that comes after Frontera, um, which will actually be called Horizon. So hence the, the title of the talk. So, um, but if you don't know TAC, and again, DK, many of you are, I know are users or vendors who've worked with us in the past, but we operate a whole bunch of systems for the National Science Foundation. Um, many of those in cooperation with our, our friends there on the Mbappage team. Um, so, but Frontera, Stampede 2, Jetstream, Chameleon for NSF, Longhorn and Lone Star 6 for our Texas um, users. Uh, that's Lone Star 6 in the picture. That's one of our current oil immerse systems. More on fitting the interconnect into that later. Um, but uh, so that's a full immersion, whereas uh, Frontera there is a direct liquid cooling um, with chiller doors and Stampede is an in-row coolers. That's the one on the left there, Stampede 2. So, um, so we run a whole bunch of big systems with a whole bunch of big interconnects. So hopefully we have a little perspective on this. And I have a little bit of experimental data to share, but not too much. Um, because I just did a site visit on Frontera, I have to tell you about Frontera stuff because um, I have all these good slides about it that I you know, was giving yesterday. So, um, so you know, Frontera is now three years old, um, or it will be September 1st that we've been in production. And uh, it remains just an awesome system that's doing a whole bunch of been spectacular stuff. So um, for the last 12 months, um, we've had uptime of over 99%, um, just you know, a few tens of hours out of production, and that includes both planned maintenance and unplanned maintenance. So um, on average, the utilization of the system is above 95%, which is a interesting feat of scheduling, given how many sort of very big jobs we run. More on that in a moment. Um, we delivered about 72 million node hours over 1.13 million jobs um, with no security instance. Um, so uh, the great thing about Stampede is it's always full. The, the, I mean, about Frontera is that it's always full. And the worst thing about it is that it's always full um, because our standard review questions are, how do you get more users and how do you make all your users run bigger jobs? And it's like, so did we mention 99% uptime with 95% utilization already? So, um, Fitting more stuff in is always a challenge. Um, but, you know, when we start thinking about the importance of MPI and getting things to scale, it's worth mentioning that we ran 2,000 jobs that were above 25,000 cores last year. And if you look, um, things above 25,000 cores are really above 512 nodes, um, was about a quarter of all the cycles we spent on the machine um, went to that, right? So. Uh, and of course, there's only so many of those you could do, right? We ran over 100 jobs that were either at half or full system scale. We'd love to run more, but if I give everybody a 24 hour full day, you know, full system run, um, we only get to run 365 jobs a year. We have more users than that. Um, we actually ran 1.1 million jobs, limiting us to a few hundred seems like a bad idea, but, um, but most of them are big MPI jobs. Um, at substantial scale. So, you know, we have the flex queue that we use for backfill, mostly very small jobs, less than an hour, you know, one, two, three, four nodes. Um, they're 20% of the jobs run, but they're like a half percent of the service units that we deliver on the machine. Um, the small jobs, one and two node jobs, we actually have a small queue for those jobs, is about 30% of jobs, so about 300,000 between flex and small, it's 550,000 of the 1.1 million but they're less than 2%, right? So 97% of our time goes to jobs that are more than two nodes, right? Which is the three nodes, you hit 128 cores on this machine. So, um, you know, the vast majority of our time is MPI jobs. Um, the vast majority of our time is bigger jobs, right? So, um, and this does see a different usage model than Stampede 2. When you put less users on the machine and you give them bigger allocations, they do run bigger jobs, right? So our average job time or size rather is about six times that of what we see on Stampede 2, where we have thousands of projects allocated. So it does run 
um, actual big jobs. And there's just some data that backs that up that I won't get into, but uh, um, you actually see that as people are adjusting to the scale of the machine, um, uh, this is 2020, 2021, 2022 job queue data that the number of jobs we run each year is going down, right? Um, or at least since the first full year of production. Um, the, uh, so we, you know, we ran almost 1.9 million in 2021. We went down to 1.1 million in 2022, but we actually charged almost 5 million more hours in 2022 because the jobs keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, and so the, those very large jobs are, you know, more than 512 nodes, more than 28,000 or so cores are the large queue, 13 million SUs and that debug queue where we run the full system jobs, um, which is another two and a half million. So. Uh, you know, about 16 million out of 65 million on uh, the the very large jobs. And again, even normal jobs start at three nodes and run up to 512 nodes. So, and if you break those down, there's a ton of peaks at 256 nodes, 64 nodes. They're big MPI jobs for the most part. So, um, the RTX is GPU runs, NVDIM is large memory runs. There's all sorts of things in there. Um, but the vast majority is, you know, those parallel jobs, right? 97%. Um, and just, you know, reminder before we get back into Mbapich of why we do this stuff, um, the science coming out of the machine is awesome. And I just want to spend a few minutes on science highlights from this year, again, because I just happened to compile them. But, you know, in 2021, we had multiple covers of science and other journals um, from things that happened on Frontera that we enabled. That's a, a desalination thing on the left and tornado formation on the right um, from our users that were the covers of science that whole issue of computing and science and engineering. Um, 2022 is still in progress, but we have lots of great science highlights coming out this year. The Event Horizon Telescope, um, some of that analysis ran on Frontera before that was released, one of the big NSF ones. Um, uh, you know, we're doing James Webb Space Telescope stuff right now, a whole bunch. Um, so lots of people looking at the VisWall, and then we have that image from the VisWall on our new VisWall. We're trying to get them to stand in front of that, and maybe we'll create a new singularity. But uh, um, the uh, but yeah, some of the James Webb mission stuff. We have some of the users here that uh, are um, looking at these sort of far flung galaxies, and this one isn't a Frontera one, but uh, this is August twelfth in the New York Times, so fairly recently. Um, and we had no idea we did anything for this until we read the thing in the New York Times. Um, and one of our staff enterprisingly dug through it. I'd happened to read the article. I didn't know it had anything to do with TAC um, in the megastorm. But if you dig through, there's a paper in science that they took this from. If you go to the paper in science, it references some TAC resources and design safe for actually publishing the data and all the data set DOIs. And it's actually the output of a bunch of wharf simulations um, you know, that you can dig back and find in our data repositories that were where they're publishing the data from. Um, and I think did the simulations on this uh, and then trace it all the way back to their NSF grant. So um, I consider it success for us when things are making the front, you know, big stories in the New York Times about big science achievements that we're contributing to and we don't even have to know about it, right? <laughs> uh, the infrastructure just works um, for folks like that. So, um, so lots going on. Um, I already talked about Event Horizon Telescope, but this is sort of how I show highlights to NSF. Um, for these things, but we did a bunch of HIV work. This is also, you know, simulation plus data analysis. You take cry OEM data about HIV, and this is, there was a fairly recent discovery that the, one of the reasons HIV is such an effective virus on, um, for mostly worse, um, is that the capsid, the actual viral capsid, makes it through the cell membrane intact, and then sort of doesn't dissolve until it hits the nucleus of the cell, which is when it delivers its payload. Um, so if it would break apart earlier, it wouldn't reach the nucleus as effectively and you know, be as persistent. Um, or if it wouldn't break apart at all, it wouldn't be as persistent, right? So we're sort of understanding the cofactors involved in um, what does that. And so again, massive simulations. This is Greg Vogt's work at the University of Chicago. Um, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy just in March, right? So all these are super recent things. Um, this is another sort of medical related one, but it's about um, neuroscience and brain chemistry. Um, you can wax philosophically about the nature of thought a lot, but the fundamental mechanism is this fast vesicle fusion between neurons. And it seems to come down to there's these uh, 
calcium signals that arrive that hit these proteins that you know can react in milliseconds to nanoseconds and instantly fuse two neurons together so they entangle um, and let electricity travel across them so um, and they've been using sort of they, they sort of suspected this was the mechanism for thought for a long time but they've been using other sort of bulk models to look at it because they couldn't build big enough atom systems to look at it now with Frontera, you know, 6 million atom systems um, for this um, NIH supported work uh, that happens. Uh, we're doing work around climate stuff. This is some carbon sequestration work. Uh, so that actually happened here at UT um, where we're doing injection of, super, well, we're simulating injection of supercritical CO2 into rock formations. And like a lot of projects we've seen lately, um, this is a, uh, um, they take tens of thousands of potential rock formations, uh, you know, mixes of minerals um, in the formation, and they use that to train an ML model. And although the machine learning is cool, 99% of the computation is the simulation to put the data together for it. And they've been able to come up with sort of two parameters that you can characterize a geologic formation with. Um, one is injection rate, which is fairly straightforward, how fast you put the CO2 in. The other is what they call wettability, which is essentially a matter of how much uh, it's like a stickiness measure of how the CO2 in liquid form actually sticks to the rock. Um, so, and if you can model those two parameters, you can sort of predict how how much and how well a site will hold CO2 for, and you know, for how long, right? Most of these are to sequester for centuries to millennia kind of thing. So, um, and that was also recently published from tens of thousands of simulations there. Uh, this one um, is from Ebru. She's up at the Colorado School of Mines doing full wave inversion of the whole planet. Um, again, this is one of those where we use whole system runs to do this. Even the typical production runs for them is are like 1800 nodes. So order 100,000 cores um, to get this done. Uh, tens of thousands of MPI tasks typically. Um, and so by full wave inversion, the, they call it an MRI of the earth because you know, when an MRI, we induce signals, send them through your body and measure the reflections to see what's going on on the inside. They're trying to do the same thing for the earth, but you need big signals. So they use seismic waves from earthquakes, right? Whenever there's an earthquake, they have these floating platforms in the ocean that they use to measure the waves. Um, or I think they've contrived the, the MERMAID's acronym for, but it's, you know, measuring marine earthquake, blah, blah, blah. Um, detection platforms, and so, if there's an earthquake, it basically sends a wave through the earth that bounces off the other side of the earth and comes back. Um, if you measure those reflections and you have some idea of the magnitude of the earthquake, um, you can measure internal features. So the first full wave inversion, um, and it is an inverse problem, but the first uh, full wave inversion study of the earth happened in uh, 2016. And the new ones are, you know, that are running in 2022 on Frontera are looking at even finer scale features as we increase the resolution, like subduction zones and hotspots and magma plumes and things like that. So um, that you can now see inside the earth by treating these earthquake waves um, as, you know, the initiator of an MRI type thing. So, uh, and speaking of acronyms where they've really stretched it, this one um, is Jarvis, uh, which they really did steal from Tony Stark and the Iron Man movies. Uh, so, um, Scientists with sense of humor. It's always wonderful. But uh, the Joint Automated Repository for Various Integrated Simulations. And I doubt that that was really the name they were going for. They just really wanted to make Jarvis happen. So um, is my guess. Uh, but this is another one, right, where the output is an AI model. And this is actually another, sequest well, not sequestration, but it's to use these sort of organic metallic frameworks, right, hybrid materials, metal organic frameworks um, that, uh, um, you can use to filter CO2 out of the atmosphere, right? Things that we can absorb CO2 with. Um, and there's, again, millions and millions of possibilities, right? It's the permutations on the periodic table um, with however many of those things you can hook together, right? So, you know, you get quickly into billions of possible materials, not all of which we can synthesize in the real world, but still there's there's millions that we can. And uh, um, so they you know, have an AI model, but they had to do 70,000 density functional theory simulations of materials as the training data set um, for that AI model. And then you train it for like eight hours on a GPU somewhere. So, um, and this is David Vanderbilt at Rutgers. Um, it was published in Nature Computational Materials last year. And, uh, you know, they said 
you know, we've understood that we could use machine learning to do this for like 40 years, but we haven't had the data sets. And um, with now close to 100,000 materials, you know, they can actually do that because of Frontera work. So that was cool. It's part of materials genome initiative that's been running at NIST for about 10 years. So, um, and again, a small sampling of hundreds, you know, or at least dozens each year on Frontera of science highlights I could have picked um, where, you know, we need these big scale things um, you know, at tens of thousands of cores that run MPI and use these software stacks um, because it's the only way we can use simulation to solve these problems. So, um, so the need's not going anywhere. So just a, a quick review. Um, the original Frontera topology was a Mellanox HDR um, machine. So, uh, and in the original configuration, we've since gone back and added a few hundred nodes post COVID. So it's more like an 8,400 node machine now. Um, uh, but we had 8,008 traditional compute nodes in 91 compute racks with 88 nodes per rack, right? And so the math we did on that is to use these, you know, HDR, we had 40 port um, switches available, right? So, um, but those are 200 gig ports, right? As we all well know. So, and at the time, this 2019, right? We had Gen 3 compute nodes. So you can only put 100 gigabits to a compute node anyway in a single card. Um, so if we do 44 compute nodes at HDR 100, um, that use 22 ports to the switch. I'll show some switch pictures in a minute. Um, if we have, uh, uh, then that leaves us 18 available ports to do uplinks to the core switches, but we can run those at 200 gig, right? So, and we have six core switches and, you know, how we got to 88 nodes per rack and all this stuff is always based on the radix of the switch and how we're dividing it up, right? So with six core switches, we take those 18 uplinks divided into six bundles of three, which gives us 600 gigabits to each core switch um, and sort of six parallel trees across those six core switches. So we have a fat tree topology in essence with um, no oversubscription in the top levels of the tree, right? From each top of rack switch back, but from the nodes to the top of rack, it's 11 to nine, right? Which is 44 over 36 um, um, reduced down. So, uh, so a small amount of oversubscription, it does seem to result in a little extra congestion that I have dedicated lines, but mostly pretty good. And then we do zero oversubscription to our data transfer nodes, service nodes, all the storage nodes, et cetera. But we do fan them out from their top of rack switches to all six core switches. So we have paths to everything, um, you know, ends up being 8,500 plus cards. You know, those original 91 racks had 182 top of rack switches. We've added a few more with the expansion nodes that are laid out a little differently because we didn't have the pooling density where we put them. Um, but, you know, it's 50 plus miles of fiber um, to put that in. Because we could do both the 11 to 9 over subscription and we could do the HDR 200 for core links and 100 to the nodes, something we'll be able to repeat at 200, 400 gig and 400, 800 gig. Um, you know, that 8,008 8 compute nodes meant we only had to run 3,276 fibers, which is still a lot, but is a lot simpler um, than, uh, you know, doing all of it. And you'll, I'll, again, a little bit later, I'll show you the switches themselves and how much cable has to fit into them. Um, and so, uh, anytime you can reduce that cable count, it's a wonderful thing. And of course we can't have a, a good interconnect without a good software stack right <laughs> on top of it. And this is where our partnership now back to the beginning of Ranger in 2006 with the Mvapich team has been invaluable. Um, is we can, uh, you know, push and tune Mvapich to new scales, more nodes, more cores, right? So this was the biggest ever CPU machine when it went online, right? So there's not a lot of places you can work at 450,000 cores. And we have actually launched an MPI task per core. It's not our recommended mode of operation, but you know, we've gone as far as 450,000 MPI tasks on this. Um, and we can make that launch and we can make that actually work and the collectives can work at that scale. And that's all been awesome. Um, and you know, it's a great test bed for Pari, DK and everybody to come in and uh, research some of the new topics and in interconnects as well. Um, and, you know, we, we end up evaluating multiple MPIs and they each have their strengths and weaknesses, but there's always some applications where Mbappich um, will just suddenly give great performance to some applications far beyond our expectations. So like when we were doing acceptance on this machine, QMC pack was one um, that went way faster than our projection for Frontera was. Um, 
but only when running over Mbappich. And in this case, um, we had benchmarked it on Stampede, uh, where um, we uh, um, were using Intel MPI on Omnipath on in our benchmarking runs. And because QMC pack has very small messages and they're all in collectives, um, in that pitch on InfiniBand in particular did much better than Intel MPI. So um, we see just a huge difference. And this is one that's also super latency sensitive, which is one of our big lessons, right? So um, when you get to a high node count, you know, having that sub five microsecond interconnect latency is huge for this machine. So, you know, it's, a, it's a terrible cloud code, I guess is another way to put it. So, um, so with all that about sort of where we are, um, let's talk about where we're going next, right? Which is to the phase two of the Frontera project is to build the leadership class computing facility. It'll be anchored around a machine named Horizon that will be roughly 10X the scale of Frontera um, in sort of overall performance, not necessarily peak performance, um, you know, not necessarily number of nodes, but in terms of the scientific things we can do with it. Um, and the throughput of the machine, you know, we're looking at 10x Frontera scale. So the peak will probably end up being in the neighborhood of 10x. It may be somewhat higher, um, given lower efficiencies, but at bigger scales, but uh, um, somewhere in that neighborhood, but 10x the science throughput. And so that is Horizon. And so when we think about designing new systems, the first thing we have to do is say, what do we know and what are our baselines, right? And what lessons have we learned from the last few systems? So, um, so in here, I promise switches. So on the uh, uh, the top and the right hand side there are the InfiniBand switches in Frontera. Um, the bottom left there is an OPA switch in Stampede 2. Um, and you see there's a actually that InfiniBand switch we could run more things to. We didn't max it out um, in mine cards. You can see that it is actually water cooled at this point um, <laughs> for the, the power density on them for the uh, and Cable management is something we take great pride in in putting these together and spend an awful lot of time and effort in. Um, but uh, that aside, more on sort of rack level cabling too on another slide. But uh, so when we think about systems, uh, so for us, you know, again, the baseline is we are a user facility, right? We can put out application stacks and great system software, um, but we don't really control the applications and how our users develop them. And um, most of them, like all software, are terrible, right? So, um, and, you know, we can occasionally kick off the rest of them, but we're a general purpose shared open environment, right? So in Stampede 2, 16,000 people have SSH access to the machine. Um, and so that's 16,000 different ways they can make something go wrong and not use our tuned set of parameters for something. Um, so we need to be general purpose. And... Typically, we have built our machines around two interconnects. Um, one is an Ethernet network, and we always sort of underinvest in that Ethernet network, right? It's not a place we want to spend our money um, because it's just there to establish those IP connections, right? Um, all of the out of band management goes over it. We need to recover a node. If you need to SSH into a node, right? It all goes that. But basically, our Ethernet is cheap and oversubscribed, um, which in a Big expensive machine like this always surprises people, but that's not where we want to spend our money because things that are performance spent uh, sensitive is over InfiniBand or OmniPath, um, or we have a Rockport test bed now. I'm going to show you some data from, but uh, uh, you know, this is where we have a fat tree, almost no oversubscription. We put all the file system traffic over it. We put all the node-to-node -node messaging over it. Um, and importantly, as again, compared to like a cloud or commercial data center thing, um, we want to go all the way to the core at near the, the you know, full bisection bandwidth for that network, right? So um, again, 36 fibers at 200 gigabits coming out of the racks, we have seven terabits a second out of the top of a rack now, right? So we're not doing a massive reduction in network at top of rack like some things are. Um, our latency in rack for our modern systems is below a microsecond. Um, you know, and this is MPI latency, application to application, not just the, the raw network latency. Less than two microseconds across the full system. Remember, in a big system like this, we might have 100 meters of fiber between the two furthest apart nodes. Worst case, you know, 50 meters into the switch, 50 meters back out. Um, so that's like 300 nanoseconds. I mean, 100 meters of fiber is about 300 nanoseconds of latency, right? And so. If you're less than 2,000 nanoseconds um, 
all the way across the system, 15% of our latency speed of light at this point, right? So it's only going to get only can get so much better on the uh, in terms of latency, but we have to think about all these things, right? And because um, uh, you know what we've learned from these applications over time is for our MPI jobs, latency is really our dominant performance driver. Um, and again, yeah. maybe 45% of our jobs are MPI jobs, but 97% of the compute time we deliver is MPI-based compute time, right? Um, on the I.O. side, it's more about bandwidth and IOPS. And given these very two very different requirements, we, of course, run both those kinds of traffics over the same network. Um, you know, in days of dreaming of higher budgets with, like, early blue jeans and stuff, you could think about having an I.O. network and a message passing network, but there's just not the... The funding and the economics don't really support doing that, right? So, um, and where are we going to put another network, right? Cooling has really complicated our cabling thing. So that's the inside of a Frontera cabinet on the left. And that sort of, well, there's a layer of power in the backmost layer, and there's a layer of water um, with those silver manifolds running up and down the rack on the inside there, um, where we have chilled water input in return, right? And then we have the layer of network on the inside um, you see, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but the fiber is coming out of the top of rack switch, which we don't put in the top of rack, but um, there's one two thirds of the way up and one a third of the way up because it minimizes cable runs. Um, but we have the, um, the that bundle of fibers, but the rest of the IB is copper in rack um, because it's short, but so there's another line of black cables and these are getting pretty dense. In fact, in our immersion machine, it's even harder, right? So this is the ethernet trunk is the yellow on the right. This is a Lone Star 6, one of those tanks opened up. And then you see the power going to the back of the rack. The InfiniBand actually jumps um, to the front of the rack in this case. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's only so much space to put cables. So adding more fabrics, difficult to do, right? So just physically, if nothing else. Um, uh, Dan? That expense. Yeah. Just a quick question. So, um... Uh, I know that uh, adding uh, more fabric is hard, I agree. But uh, has Stack considered using multiple virtual lanes that InfiniBand offers to uh, like uh, segregate traffic, like um, basically latency sensitive, band bandwidth sensitive, that kind of traffic? Yes, yes. we haven't actually put that into production at any point yet. Um, um, I think we're still a little nervous about it working in every corner case. Um, but uh, Oh yeah, tell me about yes, it. I've been asking Bill for this for 10 years. years. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, when you guys tell us it's stable and working well, I, I, yeah, I'd love to spend some more time on that. But yes, you know, and for us, particularly with IO, right, quality of service is often not about establishing a minimum. It's about establishing a maximum, right? We don't want to be have a single job overrun the metadata server or something, right? right? So, um, so, you know, people occasionally are surprised when we talk about quality of service. It's not like, well, you know, this gets up to 30 gigabits or, you know, a minimum of 30 gigabits for this one kind of traffic and 70 gigabits for the other. It's limiting the top end. So, um, but yeah, we'd like to see more of that kind of thing because we do have different kinds of traffic. Um, and with AI, the IO load is getting worse um, in a lot of ways because a lot of small files, a lot of small IOs. Um, sure. That I'm sure you see too. So, um, so, and if you could mute again, I think there's a little bit of echo. There we go. Um, yeah, so looking forward to our interconnects on the next system, um, we have a couple of options. One is we have the sort of stay the course options, right? Architect systems like we always have. And in that we have InfiniBand, you know, always the top contender here. Um, so we have the most experience with it. We know it works. Um, OPA is back with Cornelis, right? So um, OPA remains an option. Uh, there's Slingshot, the, the Cray, now HPE, Interconnect. Um, we're looking at Rockport, which is sort of physically Ethernet, but is an all optical switchless type network. And again, I have some data to show on that. You know, low latency Ethernet is still something we periodically look at, but never seems to be quite good enough um, to get there. Although, you know, Amazon and the cloud guys are pushing really hard on improving Ethernet latency. Um, but the other big path we could take is um think about disaggregating nodes and node disaggregation you normally think about of you know it's disaggregation if you're me if you're an optimist you call it composability right but the ability to say let's take the node apart and be able to attach remote memories accelerators uh um storage devices whatever it is um but effectively that means 
uh, adding a third interconnect to do that or doing it over one of your existing interconnects, right? And so how do we justify the cost for that is something we've been experimenting with in disaggregation. So, um, so a little bit on each one of those, more on the disaggregation. But in the traditional path, um, you know, certainly there are things that concern us. Bandwidth is going to go up, right? Latency is probably going to stay pretty close, but bandwidth is going to go way up, right? We'll have 400 gig, terabit, you know, in the next few years, um, at least 800 gig, probably terabit. Um, but we're particularly concerned at the moment when we think about our system design, not so much by the technical aspects of this, but how vendor consolidation um, may impact our choices, right? So, and everybody says this isn't true, but it's something we worry about, right? So, you know, will you be able to use Slingshot outside of HPE, right? And co connect other things to that fabric, right? If you want to do a different storage system, can you talk Slingshot to it, right? Will, you know, Mellanox is now owned by NVIDIA, right? So, um, will it favor NVIDIA based systems in terms of pricing, right? So, um, Again, technically it's still open. We just built an AMD based system with InfiniBand, which is awesome. Um, but will that always be true? So, and if you're doing Intel and AMD and not an HPE and not NVIDIA, then where do you go for interconnects at this point, right? So, and these type of issues might be bigger for us than technical problems we'd have with any of these, you know, again, otherwise super interesting and, and very cool products. So, um, we also need to think about endpoints um, and disaggregation changes that game. Um, and then, you know, what share of the system budget can we afford to put in and, you know, as new options emerge, are they actually viable, right? The nice thing about InfiniBand is we know it works in every scenario that we're going to put it through. Um, and even ones where it's not necessarily optimal, we at least know how it works in all of those scenarios. And with new ones, there's a lot of wild cards. So, um, just want to talk about that, but just thinking about the endpoints question, um, you know, lately in a lot of the big heterogeneous systems, we're actually seeing node counts decline because node prices are going up, right? And you're starting to put two, four, eight GPUs in them. Um, you know, so you're building $40,000 compute nodes, you're gonna have less of them, right? But that means rails per node, you know, are actually going up, right? So um, you look at like an NVIDIA DGX box, right? There's eight InfiniBand interfaces out of that thing, right? So to go with the eight GPUs, right? So do you wanna have a four, you know, a quad CPU, quad GPU node and put four network rails, or do you want to have a one, one, one kind of node, right? A CPU, a GPU and one network rail, um, you know, and there's a lot of ways to think about that, but, uh, um, you know, one of each is probably a cheaper node and a simpler node, you know, you don't have to worry about channel bonding and multiple paths in or who's controlling, you know, which socket has control of which network device and things like that. Um, but you do have to, you know, that limits you from having that big four GPU memory space or four CPU memory space. Um, so you have to adopt distributed memory. And I'm gonna hammer on that theme later, but uh, um, there's not much later left in this talk, but uh, it's coming. But, you know, a 4K node system, which isn't that big nowadays, would have 16,000 network endpoints if you do the quad rail thing, right? And if you did a 16K node system with cheap nodes, right, and said, but maybe I want to disaggregate the accelerators, storage, remote memory into pools, right? Is it unrealistic to think about having 32,000 network endpoints in the fabric, right? And we've never built one that big, right? So, you know, we're about 8,500 endpoints in Frontera right now, 85, 86 with storage nodes and stuff, but under, under 10,000 certainly. So what does a 30,000 node, you know, network endpoint network look like, right? Um, and if, you know, what does that mean in terms of port costs for network and things like that? So. Um, so, one thing we have to think about on the disaggregation side is, can we actually do it, right? So, we've been taking a long look at, you know, where does disaggregation fit in? Which, again, as I said, is another interconnect. So, um, this is a, a Giga I.O. switch on uh, one of the non-immersed racks of Lone Star 6. Um, and you see, you have this chassis that you can put GPUs and storage devices in on top, and a lot of what looks very much like an InfiniBand or Omnipath cable coming out of the back because we really are building another fabric, right? That's fairly dense to those chassis. And then you have cables off to compute nodes um, going down to actually access that stuff. And so Giga IO is one solution we've been looking at. We're looking at liquid in a couple of machines, both here and at Texas A&M. We have a bigger test bed on it. Um, 
and we're trying to get a fungible test bed in here, which is actually over your addition, you know, your existing network, which takes out the third network complication, um, but adds latency to your composability solution. Um, we put in a pretty big rock port test bed. We're putting in a DPU test bed because um, those you know, DPUs may play a bigger role in our interconnects, you know, in composability in the future, right? If you're going to have all these devices out there putting some processing on the path, um, seems like a pretty good idea. So we're looking at, uh, you know, and for MPI latency too, but um, to offload. So we're looking at DPUs, we're looking at Rockport, um, and we're looking at these various disaggregation vendors um, as options going forward. And I actually just got this from Rockport. So um, I can vouch for the numbers because those happened on our systems. Um, all the text on the right hand side is the vendor's text. So I, uh, as a public employee, I can't endorse any of their conclusions or deny any of their conclusions. So, um, but that's their stuff. But like I said, the numbers are the numbers. And the nice thing is, um, although no graph should ever have seconds per second as the metric on the y axis, like the wharf one does, um, you know, we see competitive performance. It doesn't always win. Um, but it's in the neighborhood of InfiniBand over the Rockport stuff at a few hundred nodes, right? 384 is the biggest job we can run. Um, so you're seeing, you know, different speeds. At, um, by July, we had 384 nodes up and running. So, um, but this is, you know, Wharf, conjugate gradient, uh, MD code. Um, you know, again, not all of them are faster or even, you know, in the conjugate gradient, it's almost as fast as InfiniBand, but not quite. In the case, it's a little faster. Um, MiniMD is about the same, um, you know, and there's there's some variance on this theme, but, uh, you know, it's competitive and actually works at scale, which is surprising for something this sort of young. Um, and so, but this is really encouraging data um, from the Rockport testbed. And so, and it, the slide even says proprietary, but I told them I'm sharing it publicly. So, um, so first time this data has been seen you know, in sort of a broad audience, but um, you know, it, it kind of works. So that's good news. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of things to think about when we think about, you know, adding a network for disaggregation. And we've actually tried this before in the past. And, you know, we we're in a different space technologically. Um, but that doesn't mean there aren't lessons to learn. So when we built Wrangler um, back in 2013, which I think I've talked about once, uh, this was pre-NVMe, um, you know, before the NVMe standard was set years before the NVMe over fabric thing was set and long before they had really good hardware for PCI disaggregation, but we were breaking PCI out of the box into these, if you remember the company DSSD, which later became part of EMC, which later became part of Dell. Um, the, uh, you know, the idea was we'd have these storage devices that were hooked through an external PCI fabric. And so we had 96 servers sharing half a petabyte of shared flash over a PCI interconnect. Um, and it gave us really amazing IOPS at the time when most SSDs were still talking over SATA, you know, in the age of NVMe, that doesn't matter as much anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, direct interfaces to things like HDFS back when Hadoop mattered a lot. It's not true anymore either, but, um, and technically this machine was a huge success, but, um, we did learn some lessons from it, uh, that are worth revisiting before we go down this path again. Um, so, uh, one is when you talk about PCI switches and other ASICs that cost a couple of dollars instead of the big server chips that cost like a thousand dollars. Um, there's a very different rules for supply chain. So we were promised a PCI switch chip with a certain number of ports um, that I think finally shipped six years after we went into production. Um, but it was order six years after we were supposed to get it before it actually got done. Um, so. Who knows, some vendors are delivering their roadmaps like that now, but uh, the uh, but we had to use smaller switches, which changed our number of connections per server to actually, because we weren't going to wait six years for it. Um, but we put out POSIX interfaces, and then we put out the actual native API, which was much faster, database services. Um, so if we think about lessons from that, these are all things that if you worked in HPC, you would probably guess, but 90% of users only use the file system interface, right? And, you know, we had one case where the end user workflow got 12 times faster, but that really wasn't the norm. It was mostly a more modest um, improvement. Um, the database interface gave us the best acceleration, but, you know, that covered our all three users in HPC who use databases um, that mattered for. 
HDFS performance was way better than anything else HDFS, but the whole Hadoop framework was still written in Java, and all we did was um, move the, bin, the bottleneck from the storage to all the other places it was bottlenecked with that sort of horrible implementation of stuff, and, uh, um, and zero in user applications ever got built on the API. Um, this is a lesson for storage systems and interconnect systems at this point. Um, so, although there were plenty of benefits and everything worked, for most users, if it, they would only adopt it if it was completely transparent to all aspects of their workflow. Um, and fixing a bottleneck there often meant you exposed other bottlenecks. So you can only get so much improvement without improving other bottlenecks. And in this case, cabling was particularly a nightmare because we added 400 of these thick PCI breakout cables in addition to the usual ethernet and the IB in a system that was only 96 nodes, right? So a couple of racks. Um, so the physical stuff and pulling it was really hard. Um, and then eventually, you know, as is with many specialized technologies, the commodity marketplace, in this case, NVMe and NVMe over fabric caught up and made the advantage less relevant over time. Although we do do all flash file systems in every system now, um, which was a new thing when we put it out for Wrangler. So, um, but, yeah, in the end, the retail price of this sort of boutique solution that wasn't really being mass marketed outweighed the performance advantage. Um, not that we ever pay full price, right? That's an important lesson. But um, so that takes us back to modern disaggregation. And so in a longer talk I gave on this, I had a whole set of questions that we go through with any technology before we make uh, make the decision to put it out in production. But one thing is, you know, if we were to actually do this, is there any theoretical world where it actually makes things better? And the answer is yes. Uh, it's, you know, configuring these systems um, for all kinds of workloads with our general user thing where we can't narrow down to two or three benchmarks. Um, and the fact that we can't push software changes out. Um, so, you know, switch to this new processing element that has a different programming model is pushing on a rope for us in a lot of ways. So, um, uh, so you know, given that, um, Yes, there are load conditions where having subsystems where we could compose things would definitely work. Um, so uh, I will say, and I want to go into this divide because the next slide is the one that has been my, my most Twitter quoted slide over the last week. So I have to repeat it um, since I gave the, the hot interconnects talk, but uh, deep learning workloads are still essentially immature, right? So um, so there's a lot of people building big GPU nodes, eight nodes, 10 nodes, 16 node, I mean, 16 GPUs per node, right? These big expensive nodes to support the way the software works currently. And it's possible, and I actually think it's likely that this is an artifact of the tools, right? How Torch and TensorFlow work and not necessarily the algorithm. And somebody may come along and change that. Um, but so this gets us into the, should we build thick nodes question? And I would argue we've already answered that, but I think it's a relevant lesson in disaggregation. So detour on disaggregation. So the how many GPUs per node debate. Um, you can see why this one got quoted on Twitter the most, but um, is also known as the welcome to problems we solved in the 1990s, but use different words. So the AI guys have to figure it out again on their own debate. So, um, so once upon a time, there was a huge debate in the industry about, and if you're old like me, you remember, um, whether we should build giant shared memory machines or lots of smaller machines and distributed memory clusters. And the way that went was people built really cool shared memory machines that were feats of architectural prowess and worked very well from so Silicon Graphics, Data General, Unisys, Convex, Honeywell, Sequent, big titanium servers with lots of sockets in the early 2000s. And in the distributed memory camp, there were companies who didn't go out of business. Um, so we know how this debate ended, right? And so the real question is why did distributed memory went out um, over the shared memory space? Um, and just fundamentally, this seems to be the lesson here is that all application writers would prefer shared memory. It's easier to write software for, it's easier to tune. Um, but at the same time, when you try and scale up these NUMA-based S&P machines, um, you build bigger, thicker buses, you have to worry about cache coherency protocols, it gets steadily more expensive as you scale up the number of processing elements, and eventually the cost is way more than the convenience is worth, right? And there are places like, well, we could do distributed shared memory where we hide it, 
but then physically you have the performance characteristics of distributed memory and you've made that implicit instead of explicit in the programming model so people can run into all sorts of crazy performance traps and never know why it happened um, with the sort of heavy NUMA distributed shared memory things. So in the end, the fact that the distributed hardware is 10 times cheaper wins out over the twice, you know, maybe the 2x factor in efficiency and ease. Um, and it turns out that really we can get a lot of the algorithmic space to work in distributed memory if we just worked at it and, you know, put the time into it. So for Avad or some other approach to model parallelism could well come along and we'll wonder why we ever built $100,000 super nodes um, out of GPUs when we could just build lots of little GPU nodes. Um, so that's how it ended last time. Um, my guess is the fundamentals of software physics and economics haven't changed a lot since the 1990s. Um, and so we'll, we'll see how that plays out this time, but, uh, you know, we may not have a case for doing 16 GPUs per node in the long run, which is a big part of the composability disaggregation story. Um, so can we make disaggregation actually work? So I will report back from our test beds, Rockport, various PCI fabrics. You know, obviously we don't have CXL yet because there aren't servers that can do it, um, but we can compose nodes. We can actually change the composition of nodes without rebooting and things actually work because, you know, first question is, can it make it better? Second question, does it actually work? Um, and then we have to sort of narrow down. So there's lots of potential disaggregation use cases. Each has their own value proposition and they get sort of conflated when you talk about these in general. Um, and the gist of this is, um, that I believe accelerators is the one that matters right now, right? Um, and we'll go into why. And again, you know, we're doing this over PCI now, but really this will be CXL or NVLink or Infinity Fabric or something down the line that would be these fabrics. But in general, storage, remember for us, is mostly about bandwidth and IOPS and not about latency, right? So everything I can get from disaggregating storage over PCI. I could probably get from disaggregating storage over NVMe over fabric, right? And not need another network for that, right? So yeah, we need better software layers for all flash file systems that make things more dynamic. But as far as I can tell, the entire storage industry is working on that. There's like, you know, Weka and Fast and EDM Red and other things I probably shouldn't mention out loud, but there's tons of, uh, you know, players in this for cloud storage and everything else, right? Of, Let's put piles of NVMe over fabric and fairly simple boxes, maybe put DPUs in the front end instead of traditional processors with those, um, but then just run them over regular fabric because latency is not the driver, right? So, and if latency is not the driver, why do I want to put in a third PCI fabric, increase the cost of my system by 20% um, to do that? So, remote memory has the opposite problem. Um, it cares all about latency, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we can measure differences when you don't fit an L2 cache and fall back to L3 cache in performance, right? So in memory, latency is what matters the most and CXL can bring this down some, but I'm skeptical that for our broad HPC workloads, we're gonna see huge amounts of performance here. Certainly we build inefficient large MIM nodes now with like NVDIM technologies, because there are a few use cases where sometimes you just need the answer and you don't need peak performance. Um, so to me, remote memory is sort of a niche use case, right? I'd want to enable that in some cases, but I'm not going to enable it on 100% of the nodes in the system. It's too expensive, right? Maybe we do it on 20 nodes or 5% of the nodes or something like that, but we want to have CXL memory. So that leaves accelerators and that's probably the killer app. And I know I'm running out of time, BK, so I will catch up. Um, so let's just talk about accelerators for this last little book. So, all right, if it works, if it's theoretically useful and it works, does it perform? And the answer with modern, you know, these PCI networks as a network um, is that, yeah, it does all right. Um, you know, this is comparing against some NVLink stuff, um, you know, using DGX nodes, which are of course disproportionately expensive because they have a lot of GPUs um, versus composed nodes. And it's not winning, but it's close. And you can go out to more than eight GPUs can, uh, make it up. So, uh, um, in most cases, you know, and this is again, machine learning type stuff, it's both ResNet cases, but over TensorFlow versus Torch and on regular clusters with single GPU nodes versus, you know, DGX boxes versus, uh, composed nodes. And this is actually from liquid, um, in this case is the disaggregation, but, but, you know, it's sort of 80% ish of 
DGX performance, and it is cheaper than buying a DGX. So, um, so for that use case, it kind of works, but that's not all the use cases. So um, we do have one more question is even if it performs well, um, is it actually something we can roll out to users in the general case and make it usable? Um, and I'm sure Ari and DK relate to this, right? You got to have the right interface. It's got to be transparent, right? Back to that Wrangler lesson of complete transparency. So, um, and though, you know, working out your 3D scheduling algorithms for this to be optimal are still pretty hard, but we can do basic slurm integration. We can do the orchestration for users without them having to do anything. They just have to request the jobs with the right number of stuff. Um, we've done it with slurm and OpenStack. We haven't really tried Kubernetes, but um, Given that we can do it with OpenStack and Slurm, it can probably be done with Kubernetes, and that's probably the primary use case for the vendors. So that's where they're spending their time. So, you know, I believe we can make it usable. And we have proved in Lone Star and other place that, you know, the physical can be hard, but we can do it, right? So there's no usability barriers to introduce this stuff um, and put it out there. But the really interesting question then becomes, is it economical <laughs> to put out there? We know it performs, we know we can make it usable. You know, in theory, it can be better, but what's it actually worth, right? How much percentage of the, my dollars do I want to take away from buying compute elements or other pieces of the system and put into disaggregation or essentially the third interconnect? Um, so, um, you know, things we know, GPUs are expensive. CPUs and GPU nodes don't get used that much. Um, so they're underutilized. There are facts that different code size, at least today, Needs, needs different size nodes and they're pretty hard to change, right? It's not particularly malleable that this works on four GPUs. All right, now let's half the memory size and put it on two GPUs. Eh, may not work, right? Sometimes you need a big node. Um, but when you think about this, yes, GPUs are expensive, um, but I have to buy them either way, right? Whether I buy eight way nodes or eight single way nodes and aggregate them together, still bought eight GPUs, right? So that, that price doesn't vary. Um, but like SMP is building like 16 and 32 GPU nodes or even eight today um, costs non-linearly more, but you have to buy the GPUs either way. Um, yeah, we're not using the CPUs in our, you know, when you have a cluster that's sort of heterogeneous and you have some GPU nodes and some non-GPU nodes, we're probably not using those CPUs all the time, but they're a tiny fraction of GPU performance, right? In a quad GPU node, they maybe represent eight, 9% of total performance. Um, so it's not that underutilized. Um, so Yep, am I out of time? Uh, no, so uh, well, one uh, quick uh, comment. For deep learning, at least um, for um, data loading, the CPUs are very heavily used uh, on, uh, even though the actual training is happening on the GPUs. Yeah, in some yeah. cases that's true, although the floating point units aren't busy, right? And True. Yeah, and it depends on your GPUs per socket, right? If you think about a Grace Hopper module where I have four by four, I may not need all four of those um, CPUs. So, uh, but so, like I said, true fact, but there are certainly some places where we're underutilized across the system where with composability, we could be slightly more utilized. But the question is how big is that effect, right? So, right. Um, yeah, so back to it, because I really don't want to run too long. Um, you know, but we are essentially to do this, putting in a third fabric and users won't notice this hopefully, but at some point, you guys make MPI libraries. If I hang that GPU over a third fabric, that's a third fabric. At some point, we're going to have to debug for performance, right? There's going to be some something that goes wrong. And when you think about the price of this stuff, you have to keep in mind that no one in HPC pays list price for GPUs and CPUs. So there's only so much price we're going to pay for this extra um, network, particularly if we still have to buy the other one. So, um, so I, I've run some numbers, and I can show you scenarios for different workloads where, you know, maybe you get... Some workloads, you might see a small improvement, some you might see a big improvement, but maybe for a largely heterogeneous system with like versus having where you bought some four GPU nodes, some two GPU nodes, and some CPU only nodes, you can pretty easily come up with a workload where maybe you can get a 15% advantage. Um, but that means I don't want to put more than 15% of the total system price into doing disaggregation. So um, there are many confounding factors here, right? So one is, you know, Maybe you are adding a new capability, right? If you don't have any 10 GPU nodes, but you have composability, suddenly you can run a 10 GPU job. What's that worth to you? Um, don't know the answer to that question. Uh, so um, what if, you know, with Giga IO, I can run the MPI traffic over that fabric, right? So what if I just took the InfiniBand out of the nodes, put them at the top of the rack, 
and just ran the CXL or PCI fabric in the rack. Um, you know, in a lot of workloads that might make sense, probably more like a cloud workload where, um, you know, you might have two full bandwidth IB links out the top of the rack. Um, but for us, because we're doing seven terabits out the top of the rack at the moment, and we don't want to have oversubscription in the big fabric for the big MPI jobs, um, it's going to be hard to do, right? So, um, because we're going to need to put just as many IB cards in the top as we would have had in every single node, or at least half that number with the double rate stuff. So, um, because we're building a very full fabric out of the rack, that makes the economics a little less attractive. So, um, so given all that, and given that I'm out of time, um, last slide, I don't think it's likely that we're going to use disaggregation across all the system, although I do think it fits in some niches, in like the remote memory one, right? So we might have a few disaggregated nodes and switches in there. Um, because our look, 97% MPI jobs for workloads means we probably can't build over subscription in. It doesn't make sense for us to replace one of our traditional interconnects with a CXL or PCI or NVLink or whatever fabric. Um, but again, if you could live with a terabit in and out of the rack with 400 gig links coming, um, maybe it does make sense for your workload to do that. Um, and then most importantly is that sadly our decision on which fast fabric we put in is probably not going to come down to only technical decisions about IB, OPA, Slingshot, Rockport or whatever is emerging um, because of conditions in the market. But no matter where we go, we're still going to need a great MPI implementation on top of it for most of our workload. And so with that, I will stop. So. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of our very sponsors and the Mbappage team and our partners. So, and I can take questions for whatever time you're willing to get. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Uh, are there any questions? Um, well, yes, go. Uh, sir, um, do do you see any like uh, disaggregated uh, uh, PMAM pool sort of like like wh where do you see like um, in the future? Um, for persistent memory, is there any positions in, in this level of like uh, facilities? Like, or... yeah. yeah. Um, so I will say, I thought of that more, um, not really for persistence, but as this sort of remote memory use case, right? And we do have lots of users where we put together a six terabyte node on NVDEMs, which happen to be persistent, but it's more about having the memory capacity. Um, you know, how do we enable large memory if it's something that you do 1% of the time for your post-processing step, right, but you still occasionally need it, right, or to mine a big data set um, or to do some visualization. Um, but again, I, just, I don't see that as an every node thing, but as a niche thing where we use it in a small set of use cases. Um, I will say, you know, doing it for like remote checkpoints where we could restart from that checkpoint after a failure, um, for us, it just seems too expensive to get enough of that stuff to like have every node right to it. Um, you know, let's say it was a CXL connected, like, you know, terabyte memory space, right? But if I'm doing checkpoints, I probably need about half of system RAM in that, and I need every node to be able to talk to it to enable it for fault tolerance. Um, so we haven't seen where the economics makes sense to use it for like a fault tolerance case, but to use it for the, where the persistence really matters. But to use it for like a low performing large memory case that's infrequent, it does seem to make some sense to have at least some fraction of the system in that. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Dan. Uh, any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, let's give uh, Dan a big hand. Thank you, Dan. Good to virtually see you all. So <laughs> So we'll move to the next talk. Um,